Hello, good morning. Welcome to Study the Word. This program is sponsored by the Kirkwood Church of Christ. It meets at 948 South Geyer Road in Kirkwood, Missouri. My name is Chuck Bartlett. I'm the minister for the church there. and We're glad you've joined us. In just a few moments, we're going to be dealing, dealing with this week's Bible question that actually deals with why is there a New Testament? Okay, good question. We'll deal with that in a moment. Folks, you see the website there? We'd love for you to check it out, not only for our location, our times of services, because we'd love to have you come and visit us, but you can check out our many Bible, well, our Bible programs that we've done in the past. You can check out all those Bible questions and all the Bible answers. You can scan through them. So it's a great tool to have. We always upload our programs onto our website. And of course, that phone number is for you to call if you have a question on your mind. We would love to use it on this program. A question on your mind? Chances are it's on the minds of other people. I'll put that phone number up and leave it up a lot longer at the end of our program, give you time to go get a paper and pen or put it in your phone um, because we have a lot of free Bible study helps that we offer every week. All right, so let's get into our question today, and it's a really interesting question. You know, when people buy themselves a Bible and they see that there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament, and a lot of people are confused when it comes to the Bible, and they just might want to wonder, well, why is there a New Testament? I don't, I don't understand that. Well, really, the Old Testament is just really a, a history of God dealing with the Israelites, his people. But just because they were his chosen ones, it doesn't mean that they were all faithful to God and that they all get to go to heaven. Of course not. Um, the book gives us a lot of history how that when they disobeyed God, they were punished. When they obeyed God, uh, he approved of them. And it's a lot of great lessons from that. But I will tell you this to make it simple. The reason why we have a New Testament because that was the plan all along. You can go back to the book of Genesis, the 12th chapter. There were three promises that were made to Abraham. Number one, you'd become a great nation through your seed, and you would get a special land, and somebody special is going to come from you, the seed promise, which was ultimately Jesus. The first two promises were already fulfilled. That's another study, of course, but that third promise that all nations would be blessed. Now, for all nations to be blessed, we would need a new law, a new testament. As long as there was the old law in place, the law of Moses, there was going to be a wall between the Jews and everybody else, which, which were referred to as Gentiles. Now, I'm not making that up. You know, that's not my own wording. That's, I'm actually quoting from the book of Ephesians because he tells us in, in the second chapter about this wall that needed to be broken down. He says in verse 13, but now, I'm in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off, talking about Gentiles, and have been made near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has broken down the, what? Broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So there can be unity for all people if they take a hold of that new law, that New Testament, the law of Moses done away with. Now I want to first take a few moments to tell you that this shouldn't have surprised people when Jesus came on the scene and was going to bring a New Testament a new law, because the prophets of old, in the Old Testament, prophesied about it. I'm going to read a little bit here, and it's going to sound familiar to you when I go to the New Testament, but I'm in Jeremiah. It's real easy to remember. Jeremiah 31, 31. 
That's where I'm going to start. But I'm going to read Jeremiah 31, 31 through verse 34. Listen to what the prophet said way back then. He said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. That's what the prophet Jeremiah talked about. And so when I think about Jeremiah, who wrote around, you know, 640 BC, okay, almost 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene. Now you want to know what's interesting. If you will open up your Bible or write it down and read it later, I'm going to go over to the book of Hebrews, all the way over in the New Testament. Now, we just read back there in Jeremiah 31, 31 through verse 34. And now I want to read something here. And it's uh, in verse 8 of Hebrews 8. Now, when I start reading this, the Hebrew writer writing by inspiration, as I'm reading this, ask yourself, if this sounds familiar? Okay, so I'm in Hebrews in the New Testament, beginning in verse 8 of chapter 8. It says, because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with them, make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother say, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Where does that come from? Oh, yeah, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. He's quoting it here. You know, it's interesting. Look what the Hebrew writer said in the next verse. He said, and he says, a new covenant. He now made the first, first what? Covenant. The first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. People say, now, why is there a new covenant? Well, because that was the plan. You needed a new covenant so you could bring all people together. They all could be one, where all nations would be blessed. That's what we read or I made reference to in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. Remember, all nations would be blessed. Here we are, and that was way back in Genesis you go over to Galatians all the way to the New Testament and you see in the third in the uh, third chapter, he makes reference to the very thing that we were talking about with Abraham and through him, how that all nations would be blessed. So he says in verse 16 of Galatians 3, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So here it is. We are under this new covenant. Now look what he says in verse 17, because some people, you know, want to make a big deal about the law of Moses. He says in verse 17, this I say that the law, about the law of Moses, which was 430 years later, that came after what? 
cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here's this promise way back in Genesis. 430 years later, there's the law of Moses. And then way over here, we have the new covenant. And what Paul is writing to the Galatian brethren, don't put so much emphasis on the law of Moses, because before the law of Moses, 430 years before that, God gave this promise to Abraham that in his seed all nations would be blessed. He's telling us in Galatians chapter 3 that seed promise was fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus was going to bring a new covenant. That was part of the plan, folks. Now, this new covenant that we have, when did it come into effect? That's a, that's a great question. So when I go back to Matthew, the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, we see Jesus talking about the fact that he's, he's going to die. So he's talking about this, this uh, Lord's Supper that he was going to institute. And he was talking about the bread and, and, also in the, and the fruit of the vine. So in Matthew 26, verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, this is the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and said to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. And notice verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. You see, Jesus was going to have to die. People often ask that question, you know, why, why did Jesus have to die? Well, if we go back over to the book of Hebrews, we were in the 8th chapter, now we're going to be in the ninth chapter. Now in the ninth chapter, he comes out and says in verse 15, Hebrews chapter 9, he says, and for this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called might receive the promise of the internal inheritance. So Jesus' blood even helped those under the old law. And it's going to, in other words, the blood flowed both ways, those living after Jesus died and those that lived before Jesus died. Now notice what he says in verse 16. He says, for where there's a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now we understand what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 26. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood. See, Jesus died. And when Jesus died, that's when his testament became law. That's what it said right here in Hebrews chapter 9. Where there's a testament, there needs to be the death of a testator. So I have a will, okay, I have a will, but that will does not become law until I die. That's what he's talking about right here. So in our Bibles, we have an Old Testament. The word testament means like a, an agreement. Um, we have a we have a, a an agreement with our God, and so you have an Old Testament that existed between God and and the Israelites, okay? And they were to keep that law. Most of them didn't, of course. Most of them violated the word of God. If you read over there in uh, Acts the seventh chapter, you'll read about Stephen giving a great sermon that's telling these Jews that are before them, giving them a history of their forefathers and coming right out and saying, which of the prophets did your forefathers not kill? They didn't like to be told what God wanted them to do. They were very rebellious. Now, God used them to ultimately fulfill his promise in sending his son to die on the cross for us. It was all part of the eternal plan. But just because he used the Jews doesn't mean they've got a one-way ticket to heaven because we already read earlier 
that the fact that Jesus broke down the wall, how did he break down the wall between the Jew and the Gentile? By removing the old law and bringing a new law. As long as that wall stood in place, you were going to have division between the Jews and the Gentiles. But when he broke that wall down, now they could become one under the gospel, the new, te the new testament, that new covenant that has been given for those who would obey it. Now, I know not everybody wants to today. There's still division in the world. But what we're saying is Jesus provided that way. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. So when we're thinking about the, the New Testament that we are under today, people want to go back and they want to bring things from the Old Testament and bind them on people today. You can't do that. And there's a lot in the New Testament where people were trying to do that. And they were being rebuked by the Lord. So we have a new covenant. Why do we have a new covenant? It's so that we can be one in Christ. That was the point. All people can be. Now, when we get back to that idea of bringing things over and the dangers of it, let me give you an example over here in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and it reads, here's what Paul wrote to the church there at Galatia. These were Christians. There were some problems there. The problems in the first century that the, the early Christians faced is when Jews were being converted and they were bringing Judaism in. They were bringing, they wanted to bind old law on people. And here's just an example. In verse 1 of Galatians chapter 5, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, which means freedom, the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Christ did what? He, he gave us a new covenant. Now he says, and do not be entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you had fallen from grace. He's talking about the law of Moses. That's what he says. Now, if you're going to go back, he says, if you're going to bind circumcision, then you're going to have to keep that whole old law. When you do that, you've separated yourself from Jesus is what he's talking about. No, don't, don't fall victim to that, folks. There are a lot of religious groups who are bringing things over and binding on them. And they're just nothing more than what we talked about last week, the traditions of men. And, and, and you can see them all the time. You'll have people who will, They'll wear special garments up front. Why? Well, because the, under the Levitical priesthood, they wore garments that separated them from the rest of the children of Israel. They wore special garments. People want to bring that over today. You know, when you come in our services and we worship God, we all dress alike. Well, not exactly alike, but, you know, I'm not wearing a special garment to separate me from the rest of the congregation, folks. I'm not more special than anybody else. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches in First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, all Christians are considered priests, and Jesus is our high priest. And so they're bringing things over and binding them. That's why we've had to deal in this program. People say, well, Chuck, what's the Bible teach about tithing? Well, remember, we're under the new covenant. The Old Covenant, tithing. The New Covenant, lay by in store, so we purpose in our heart. People want to bring those things over and bind them on the burning of incense they, they want to bring across. Yeah, the list goes on and on. And, and that's the problem that we're facing today because people are not wanting to accept the fact that we have a New Testament that everybody is to abide by. And Jesus said, you know, when, when he's talking about the truth that we have today, he's saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, there are times when people don't want to hear that. How many times have we turned over and studied 2 Timothy chapter 4? Because Paul was telling a young preacher there, Timothy, look, at, you need to preach the word and be instant in season and out of season. 
Because there's going to come a time when they don't want to listen to sound doctrine, it says. The doctrine of Christ. That's 2 John 9. If you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. Well, who does he mean there? I mean, what if some people just want to keep the Old Testament? No. You, everybody needs to abide in the doctrine of Christ. If you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. This is why we have the New Testament. When you go back to Hebrews chapter 8, he says, there's sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now, there's an interesting point, and we have time to make it. You know, in that reading, when it says in Hebrews chapter 8, that you won't have to tell anybody, know the Lord for all will know me. Do you know what that means? What does it mean that you, you don't have to tell them to know the Lord? Well, see, under the old law, Jews were born an Israelite. They were born that way. And so they, didn't, they had to be taught, know the Lord as an Israelite. As an Israelite, they, the babies didn't even know who they were. So as they grow up, they, you know, you're an Israelite, you're an Israelite, you're an Israelite, as they, as they grew up. But you know what? When it comes to Christians, there's not a Christian on the face of this earth that when they become a Christian, you have to tell them, you, know, you know, need to know the Lord. Well, they couldn't, have become a, they couldn't become a Christian until they did know the Lord. And so that's the difference between the two. You might be born an Israelite, but you're not born physically into the, a Christian. You're not born a Christian. Yeah, you are born again when you're older and you meet the prerequisites and you obey the gospel. We understand that. But I'm just saying... My wife and I, if we have a child, when that child was brought into this world, they're not a Christian. No, they're okay. They're not born in sin, and we've studied that in the past. But when they become a Christian, now, now they're a part of God's family. They know the Lord. And so it's things like that that, that, that we need to rightly divide the Word of God, and we see the value of understanding that we are under the New Testament. Now, does that mean we don't read the Old Testament? We don't study the Old Testament? No, no. There's a lot of things that we study in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, we're told in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, all things written aforetime were written for our learning. There's a lot of the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament. We learn about great men of faith. We learn about creation. We learn about the, the dangers of rejecting God and and. We learn about God's love and God's mercy and God's long-suffering. We learn that God could have just made an ark, but you know what? He had Noah build it, and it took a long period of time, and Peter called Noah a preacher of righteousness. So you see the love of God throughout the whole Bible. But let's remember today's lesson, folks. Why is there a New Testament? Because that was part of God's plan from the very beginning that would unfold the scheme of redemption it was way back there in Genesis, and it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus died, he brought us the New Testament in his blood, Matthew 26 and verse 28. Hope this has been a help to you. Maybe you have some questions that relate to that. I'm glad to do that. We can expand that on a, another program. But we're glad you've tuned in today. And now it's time to let you know that we have other free Bible study helps that you can learn and study the Word of God throughout the week. You don't have to wait for Sunday morning when this program airs. But if you would like to receive a six-lesson home Bible study course, we'll mail you the first lesson. All you need, folks, is your Bible. You just open it up, look at the questions, and you just learn. And if you're not uh, afraid to learn the Word of God, We've often said the only thing that suffers from investigation is error. It's the truth that sets us free. If you'd like to study the scriptures in the comfort of your own home, call that number, leave your name and address on voicemail, or you can text us your name and address. We'll get that first lesson out in the mail tomorrow. Don't worry, nobody's going to show up at your door. You work at it at your own speed. When you're finished, you pop it in the return envelope that we give you. It has a stamp on it. And you send it back, we check it over, we return it to you so you can hold on to it for future reference along with your next lesson. Now there's something else that we could throw in with your first lesson, that's the two pamphlets. Every week we offer the 4030. That's all you have to put in your 
in your text or voicemail, just say, send the 40 30 tracks. What are they? 40 things that people are telling you, they're telling a lot of people in this world. Here are 40 things they're saying, this is in the Bible. But they're not. You look at those 40 things. And you say, well, Chuck, what do you mean they're not in the Bible? I've been told they're in the Bible. They're not. And you could write me back and just say, hey, this is in the Bible, isn't it? I was like, no, no, it, it's not in the Bible. You can look at those 40 things. Maybe you've been taught that. Maybe you believe them. But you need to look at that for, list of 40 things. When you do that, also request the 30. Those 30 things that are listed are things where people are saying, these things are not in the Bible. Yeah, they are. And there's the verse that proves it. Why people would get it up in pulpits across the land, why religious groups would say, this is not in the Bible, when it clearly says it in the Bible. You need to look at those 30 things. So, so they're of interest to you. you go ahead and request them. And there's no charge for anything. That's not what this program is all about. We're not trying to solicit your money. We're trying to encourage people to open up their Bibles, listen to God, not become a follower of man, become a follower of the Lord. Now, you could be put on the mailing list if you would like. Just say, Chuck, put me on the mailing list for the weekly bulletin. Just some additional teaching, some more learning of pointing you to the scriptures and learning some uh, other things like this program, other Bible questions and answers. So if you'd be interested in wanting to receive that, tell us, say, put me on the mailing list. And we'll be glad to do that. No charge. Now we also offer for folks who say, you know what, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the course, but I would like to learn more. Can I have a face-to-face -face Bible study? If that's your question, the answer is yes. We'll be glad to. Come to your home or meet at a church building. Uh, meet at a coffee shop, wherever you're comfortable. You can invite others. Your lady that wants to learn more of the Word of God, I would come, but I would bring uh, my wife with me or somebody else so, so you wouldn't feel uncomfortable. If you would like a face-to-face -face Bible study, you can do that weekly, get together for 40, 45 minutes at a time that fits into your schedule, morning, afternoon, evenings during the week or on the weekends. Would you like to join a small Bible class? You can do that. We've had others say that, and, and we have other Bible study groups you can join. If that's of interest to you, please let us know. Jot that number down. Have it handy. Maybe not right now you want to call. Maybe you want to call later. Please have it handy. We hope that, folks, if you're ever in the Kirkwood area, that you'll feel comfortable enough to come by and say hello. We've had a number of people show up, and we'll, and I've gone back, and I said, well, what brought you here? And they say, well, I saw the TV program, thought I'd come by and say hello, and we're glad they did. Folks, if you're in the area, come and be with us. Every Sunday morning at 9.30, we meet for a Bible study. 10.20 starts our worship, goes to about 11.30. We meet in the afternoons from 5 to 6, and then every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, we have a midweek Bible study. Bring the whole family, classes for all age groups. You'd be our honored guest. We hope that you'll be a regular viewer of our program. Tell other people about that because we just give you a Bible answer to a Bible question. You tune in next week. We're going to open up our Bibles together. And yes, we are going to study the Word. Thank you. and Have yourselves a great day.